Well, welcome again. I'd like to finish introducing you to the living history people that are here today. Uh, we all enjoy doing this, and we'll do it every chance we get. I'll introduce you to Doug Camper. He has been doing this for a number of years, and is always willing to help us out in any way he can. So I'm going to let him introduce the rest of the uh, people to you. All right. Okay. Um, my name is Doug Camper. Uh, I didn't do very well at public speaking in college, so you'll have to forgive me. <laughs> but um, I'm a Civil War reenactor of 30 years. Um, so it's my pleasure as we put together this ensemble of is uh, the first part, well, the first, it was half of the Confederate cabinet in 1861. Um, and I'll point out each person, starting with to Alexander Stevens, Vice President of the Confederate States of America. He would uh, remain in that office from 1861 to 1865. Uh, the gentleman portraying him is Russell Chu, uh, Civil War reenactor from 1989 on forward. Next is Robert Toombs, who uh, I believe is Secretary of State. Is that correct? No. And he would only be with the Confederate government for about a year. He would become a Brigadier General and then uh, be a govern a Senator from the state of Georgia in the Confederate government. Uh, the person portraying him is Mark W. Menner. A he's a reenactor. He's been a reenactor for longer than I have, since about 1989, I think. Started when I was two. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, we had, uh, he had looked up the information to portray Mr. Toombs. So if you have any questions, ask. Um, finally, we have uh, Mr. John H. Reagan. Postmaster General, Confederate States of America. He would hold the post all throughout the war. Him, Alexander Stevens, and Jefferson Davis are the only ones that kept the jobs that they were initially assigned in 1861. Jefferson Davis didn't realize he was going to be elected as Confederate president, but he did get it. Um, he was a Democrat before the war. And his vice president, Alexander Stevens, was a Whig before the war. And about half of the Confederate government was what would be considered uh, unionist, including myself. I am portraying Colonel James Chestnut. My wife uh, during that time was the famous diarist Mary Chestnut, and she was a close friend to. Jefferson Davis and most of the inner circle of Richmond that had most of the government officials like Lewis Wigfall and uh, even John Bell Hood. So, and we also have Mr. Cooper. I forgot to introduce him. He snuck in on me. This is Samuel Cooper. He would be uh, uh, what? Secretary, of War. Secretary of War in 1861. Later on, he would end up becoming a brigadier general and then a major general and serve in the far western theater with the uh, Indian command of Stan Wadi. So, and I believe he finished out the war as a major general. Uh, the gentleman portraying him is Mr. Joe Grisham, who is pretty recent as a reenactor. So but we volunteered him for the position. Thank you, sir. So, so thank you again for having us, and uh, may I present the Honorable President Jefferson Davis. Thank you, sir. If you gentlemen would like to find a seat. If you gentlemen would like to find a seat. Ladies, if you would like to come out and find a seat. Let's see, and if you, if you don't mind, if you'll move your seats this way, that way I can stand up here, because I tend to wander a lot. Yeah, I'll just get up here and talk. Uh, 
Well, good afternoon. I'm going to remove my hat. I might want to do some serious talk. You folks might not think I'm too serious with my hat on. My name is Jefferson Finise Davis. I am the President of the Confederate States of America. A lot of you know who I am, but I don't think you know anything about me. So I thought today, especially with a crowd like this, certainly these gentlemen know more about me than most people do. But most of you don't know that much about me, so today I want to take an opportunity to tell you something about me and tell you how I ended up being the President of the Confederacy. I was born on June the 3rd, 1808, in a little log cabin in the foothills of Kentucky. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sort of like another man, a man by the name of Abraham Lincoln. He too was born in a log cabin in the foothills of Kentucky. Not too long after I was born, we both grew up to be president at the same time. That's where the similarities end. My daddy named me Jefferson Finise Davis. Jefferson was in honor of Thomas Jefferson, a man my father greatly admired and who was president when I was born. I am told that Finise is Latin and it means final. You see, father decided I was his final child. I was number 10 of 10 and we ranged in age from my infancy to my older brother Joseph, who was 23 when I was born, a man much like my father. My mother was 46 at that time. Well, not long after I was born, my daddy decided we needed to move to a warmer climate. So he packed up the family and the slaves, and off we went to Mississippi, just below Vicksburg. Daddy wasted no time, he and the slaves, clearing the land to plant cotton fields, build our home, and put in my mother's rose garden. You see, mother was fond of roses. As a matter of fact, our home was known as Rosemont. My early childhood was good, as well as I recall. I always had plenty of siblings to play with, what with nine brothers and sisters. My early education took place in a little one-room log cabin. This would all end when I turned eight years old. You see, Daddy decided of his ten children, I showed great promise, and I should become a noble Southern gentleman. Well, to do that, takes a certain amount of higher education. That was not to be found about Rosemont. So Daddy decided he's going to send me to Kentucky to go to St. Thomas Catholic School. And I guess y'all figured out by now, when my father made a decision, that was final. There was no change in his mind. That was a trait my brother got from him. I was put in the keep of a Major Hines, who was a friend of my dad's. We embarked on our 700-mile journey to St. Thomas. Well, along the way, we stopped at a place called the Hermitage in Tennessee. We stayed at the home of a man named Andrew Jackson. I liked Mr. Jackson. He was a very nice man and a very devout man, contrary to what some folks may think. We never sat down at his table to break bread that we did not bless it first. I'm sure he had an effect on my life later on. Well, when I got to St. Thomas, we'd stayed at Mr. J Jackson's for about two weeks, and then we continued our journey. And when I got there, I realized real quick I was either the youngest or one of the youngest students there, which was fine with me. I was used to being the youngest, a little arrogant, a little headstrong, and some folks would say a whole lot spoiled. That may be true, too. I did well at St. Thomas, but I was only there for two years. You see, Wilkerson County Academy was built close to Rosemont. Well, Daddy decided I needed to come home and commend my studies there, probably so he'd keep a closer eye on me. He knew how I was. So I made that 700-mile journey back and commenced my studies at Wilkerson. But I will tell you, folks, I didn't apply myself. As a matter of fact, I got called in by the head schoolmaster, and he reprimanded me that I wasn't being serious enough about my studies. Well, being headstrong as I was, I grabbed up my books and out the front door I went. I wasn't going back. Got home and told my daddy what happened. He gave me two choices. You can either go back to Wilkerson, continue your studies, or I can use another hand out here picking cotton. Well, I'm kind of headstrong, right? And I looked at my daddy and I said, I will pick cotton. It took me two days to figure out I did not want to spend my life picking cotton. <laughs> I went back to Wilkerson and continued my studies. 
Long about 1822, Daddy fell on hard times and Rosemont had to be sold. Thank goodness my brother Joseph was an up-and-coming attorney and he was able to purchase it and keep it in the family along with his plantation hurricane. Now I remember my daddy told me, Jefferson, get good knowledge at all costs because with knowledge comes power. He told me that right before he passed away. But you know, my education was not to suffer because of his hard times. I was going to be enrolled in Transylvania University. That's where I was when Daddy passed away. And I went back home. When I got home, I found out he and Joseph had had a long discussion about me. They had decided my future and what I would and would not become with my life. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, that greatly upset me. They planned out my life, and they haven't even consulted me. But like I said, Joseph was a lot like Daddy. Once a decision was made, there was no change in it. After a long discussion, we came to a compromise. You see, they had decided I was going to West Point Military Academy in New York. And I told them, I do not want to be a, a military man. I want to read law. So our compromise was I'd go to West Point for a year. If I still was unhappy, I could come back and enroll in the University of Virginia to study law. And that seemed like a good compromise. So off to New York I went. I met some interesting fellows there. Robert E. Lee, exemplary student, great leader of the cadets. Sidney Andrew Jackson, Johnson would be a friend of mine the rest of his life. Joseph Johnson, another fine man. All three of these men later would serve under me in the war between the states as generals. Well, if Robert E. Lee was an exemplary student, I was anything but. I simply could not abide by all the rules and regulations that they put forth for a cadet. Do this, don't do that. I recall one year, it was about the holidays, and we had some eggnog in the barracks. Well, me and the rest of the cadets decided we need to liven up that party so we procured some hard liquor to go in that eggnog, and we got caught. Well, I figured I'd get expelled, but all they did was confine me to the barracks for a while. Another time, there was a tavern not too far from the, from the barracks, and we were told, you are not allowed to go in that tavern. There you go again, telling me what I can and can't do. So I coaxed some of my buddies, and we went to that tavern one night, Unfortunately, I fell down a river embankment and was in the hospital for a while after that. I figured, there goes my military career. I think Joseph intervened. I didn't even get expelled. After four years, I finally graduated from West Point. Not the best student, but not the worst either. I was 23 and 32. My first tour of duty was going to be at Fort Crawford in Wisconsin Territory, out in engine country. Well, I had some time to spare before I had to be there, so I went back to visit my family. And when I took my leave to go, I took James Pemberton, my manservant, with me. Father had given him to me before he had passed away. So when we got out there, I found out that my job was to make the fort larger and more secure. Well, to do that, you have to have timber. There were very few trees around Fort Crawford. So we had to canoe upriver chop down the trees, lash them together, send them back down the river so we had the timber to do what we wanted. In the process, I caught a virus. Extreme temperature, delirious. Got to the point I couldn't even walk. Thank the Lord, James Pemberton was there with me. He nursed me back to health. I would have surely died had he not been there. Well, I got better, but I was plagued by an illness one after the other after that. But while I was there, I met a beautiful young lady, Sarah Knox Taylor. She was so pretty. She was the daughter of Colonel Zachary Taylor, who later was President Zachary Taylor. We commenced to court and we fell in love. And I asked her daddy for her hand in marriage. He said, absolutely not. I will not have my daughter marrying a military man. I was heartbroken. He even sent me away so we wouldn't be in close contact, but we continued to write. I went home and I talked to Joseph and told him my predicament. He gave me a thousand acres of land 
loaned me the money to buy my slaves so that I could start my plantation. I went back and resigned from my commission, and once again asked for Sarah's hand in marriage. Her parents reluctantly agreed, and we were married in 1835. After a honeymoon, we returned to Mississippi to start working on our plantation. And as I recall, there were so many briars on the place, we named it Briarfield. Well, we started, and unfortunately, we're going into the fever and the chill season. Sarah's mother and I talked about it, and we decided that we probably needed to move somewhere warmer until the house was finished. It was a decision we made too late. By the time we got to my sister's place, which was more in-state, both Sarah and I had malaria, her case much worse than mine. They put us in separate rooms to recuperate, and I called one night. I got up and I went to check on Sarah. She raised up weekly, sang a favorite song of ours, Fairy Bells. She passed away that night. I was devastated. We'd only been married three months. I'd lost the love of my life. For weeks, I lingered between life and death and really didn't care which came. I'd lost everything I cared about. Once again, James Pemberton was there and he nursed me back to health. When I was able to travel, he carried me and put me back on a steamer and we went back home. When Joseph saw me, he decided I wasn't well enough to withstand the winter, so he had me go to Cuba for the winter. In the spring, I was able to travel. I sailed to New York made my way down to Washington and met another fine gentleman by the name of Franklin Pierce. He, would too, would be a friend forever. From there, I went back home, and I became a recluse. I hardly left my plantation for eight years. I read a lot, worked on the plantation, had long talks with my brother. It was interesting what was going on in the United States. You see, tariffs and taxes had been levied on imports and manufactured goods. Well, now that didn't affect the people up north too much, but it greatly affected us southerners because we're farmers, which raised our prices on everything. Before you know it, there were folks talking about succeeding from the Union over the taxes and the tariffs. Well, this kind of calmed down a little bit. I got interested in politics and decided when I was 34 that I would give it a hand. I was going to run for the Senate of Mississippi and I lost that run. But about the same time, I guess Joseph had decided I'd been a recluse long enough. The Howe family were good friends of my brother's, and he had invited their daughter, Lorena Howe, to come for the holidays, and I was sent to fetch her. Well, when I met Miss Howe, she was 17 years younger than me, but she was a beauty, intelligent, Smart, witty, carry on a conversation, anything you could expect out of an individual, Verena was. Sometimes sassy to a point, but that's understandable. I was intrigued. She, on the other hand, I'm not quite sure she was quite as intrigued. She wrote a letter to her mother, and she said, I'm not sure about Mr. Jefferson Davis. I can't determine if he's old or if he's young. But he must be old. He's only two years younger than you. Now, I'm not sure I'd have put that away with my mother, but Sarah, uh, Verena did. And she went on to say, he has a trait of thinking everyone agrees with him, whether they do or not, a trait that I think irritates me greatly. And the final thing she said to her mother, she said, but he is sweet. He's refined. He's cultivated. Even if he is a Democrat. You see, her family were all members of the Whig Party. And as far as they were concerned, if you were a Democrat, you were what the slaves called poor white trash. Well, be that as it may, we commenced to see each other and went for long rides and things. And as was customary, I asked for permission to start a formal courtship with her. Well, at first, her parents were against it because of background, certainly political reasons, and age difference. But they finally agreed. We were engaged shortly thereafter, and we got married. And shortly after we got married, I was elected to the House of Representatives, 1845. So we go to D.C., 
and it was there only a short time, the Mexican War broke out. I resigned because I wanted to fight in the war. I ended up getting injured in that war, a bullet passed into my ankle. I ended up coming home on crutches. We won the war, and with it we got the territory for California, Texas, Nevada, and Utah. Well, this opened a whole new can of worms, because you see, up until then, it was an equal balance, slave states, free states. So it was going to determine if this free territory became states, and they didn't allow slavery, that would go and tip the balance the wrong way, and vice versa. If they became slave states, it was going. So there was a lot of discussion that would go on for a long time. I was asked in 1851 to resign and run for governor of Mississippi, which I did, and I lost, which meant I was going home to Verena. She was happy about this. You see, she was pregnant with our first child. At 43 years old, I was going to become a father. Samuel was born that year. Unfortunately, he only lived a couple of years. But I would not stay out of politics the whole time because my good friend Franklin Pierce was now president. He asked me to be the Secretary of War, a job that I thought was well suited to me. So that I did. We did that job for four years. Then I was elected to the Senate. About a month after I was elected, something called the Dred Scott case happened. And I don't know if you're familiar or not, but Dred Scott was a slave whose master moved in and out of free territory with him. Because of that, Dred Scott thought he was a free man. Well, when his master passed away, the widow said, absolutely not. You are not a free man. Well, he tried to buy their freedom, and she wouldn't allow that either. So he decides, I'm going to take this to the court, to the Supreme Court of the United States. They determined that Mr. Scott was not an American citizen. He was a descendant from Africa. Therefore, he could not go to our court systems and have his case tried. Well, this pleased the Southerners. It infuriated the Northerners. This could have been the start of the fire. Then in 1859, a fellow by the name of John Brown, Hoppus Ferry, he decides to go in and capture the armory to try to get a slave insurrection going. Thank the Lord they sent in Robert E. Lee and Jeb Stewart to take care of the situation. John Brown was wounded, captured, and later hung for his insurrection. 1860, a feller by the name of Abraham Lincoln was elected the President of the United States. Now, he was not an abolitionist, but he also did not approve of slavery in the Free Territories. This greatly upset the Southerners. With his election, it accomplished something that the secessionists had never been able to do, people succeeding from the Union. South Carolina was the first to do so in December of 1860. Shortly thereafter, right after the first of the year, 1861, Mississippi, my state, succeeded. I now am a senator with no state to represent. So I go and resigned from the Senate. It was a sad day. I went back to Briarfield. Now, I recall the morning in February of 61 that I found out I was going to be the president of the Confederacy. Verena and I were out in the Rose Garden tending to the roses, and I see a messenger coming in the distance. I feared I knew what that message was going to say. You see, I knew that they were having a convention in Montgomery, Alabama, for the sole purpose of electing a leader. I'd also heard that my name had been passed around. You fellows probably heard that too. I purposely did not go to that convention thinking they will not elect someone that's not there. But they did. As I read that and opened that message, it said, Greetings, Mr. Jefferson Davis. You are the elected provisional president of the Confederate States of America. As I closed that message and put it in my pocket, I thought, dear God, take this responsibility from me. You see, I did not want to be president. I was 52 years old in frail health and feared a war was looming, a war that I wasn't sure we could win. 
We didn't have the money nor the supplies or anything else. But I was president. Due to my loyalty and allegiance to the South, I accepted that position. The following day, I took my leave to go to Montgomery to be inaugurated. I recall it was a long trip, six days. We stopped 25 train stops between Briarfield and Montgomery. And at every stop, I made the same statement. I do not seek, nor do I want, a war with the Northern Brothers. However, if war happens, I will fight with every ounce of blood in my body to protect the cause and the South. We wasted no time after the inauguration of building a cabinet. Then we decided that if the North was going to strike the South, it would most likely be in Virginia. So the capital was moved to Richmond. April of 1861, the South Carolina militia fired on Fort Sumter. Shortly thereafter, President Lincoln put a blockade on our, on our ports. First battle, first battle of Manassas. I recall going out afterwards, seeing 3,000 Northerners dead, 2,000 of our boys. There were shouts of jubilation all around, and I'm thinking, we can't sustain a long war. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where we are today. We're fighting. We're fighting for a just cause. I only ask that God grant what we need. If you have boys that are gone, I ask God to protect them and bring them home to you. Thank you for spending time with me today. I must take my leave because I have important business to take care of.